Hi, y'all. So we are here from Tink Media. We are a podcast growth and discoverability uh, company. But so we focus on marketing, but we're also all huge, huge audio people. So don't get worried about this being too salesy, too marketing-y. That's really not what we're about here at Tink. All of us come to this field of work from other fields of work in audio. So some of us were journalists covering the audio industry before we got here. Um, almost all of us have actually worked on shows and have produced shows. So I'm just going to go quickly down the line of everybody here just to give their names a quick introduction and the last podcast episode that you listened to. So my name is Will Williams. The last podcast episode I listened to um, was the very first episode, season one, episode one of Someone Knows Something, which came out like 10 years ago or something. Um, so I'm a little late to the game, but I'm getting there. Uh, Shreya, what about you? Hi, my name is Shreya, I'm a pronouncer she, her, and the last episode that I listened to was of the podcast No Small Endeavor, and it's about how poetry can help us in times of adversity. Really need to listen to that right now. Yes. <laughs> Andrea, what about you? Hi, my name is Andrea Koskai. She, her pronouns as well. And the last podcast I listened to is Bad Bridget. It's an older podcast from 2020 that I only uncovered because I was looking for European podcasts. And it's about Irish women's journey to the States and how the American dream sort of became a nightmare, quote unquote, uh, for them. Very interesting listen. If any of y'all have recommendations for European podcasts, specifically ones that aren't in the UK, but otherwise European, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And I will be watching the chat as we go. So feel free to put questions there. I know we have Q&A, but I'll be like storing them in my brain. Devin, what about you? Hi, I'm Devin Andrade, also she, her pronouns. Uh, the last podcast episode I listened to was from Everybody in the Pool. It's a climate solutions podcast, and it was an episode about pro athletes who are advocating for greener sports. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> so we're here to just have a little bit of a panel discussion about discoverability, about a little bit of monetization, but how we can use our medium to collaborate with others to deal with these discoverability problems. So we all know that audio is a very special, unique medium, unlike any other entertainment media out there. Um, but I want to ask y'all, what makes it special or at least unique in terms of marketing, monetization, and helping your discoverability? Um, and Devin, I'm going to start with you. Mm. Um, I think that first off, the thing that makes it unique in terms of marketing is how collaborative it is. I know podcasting can feel really isolating, but when you go out and you start thinking about reaching your audience or partnerships, it really is collaboration over competition because you want to get in front of existing podcast listeners first. That's why your fellow podcasters are your best collaborators collaborators for your growth. Um, that kind of trickles into what makes the monetization unique. For me, I think it's that you are so much closer to your audience and who you're building this relationship with, and that can help with monetization options. It's also just kind of a newer medium for advertisers, for sponsorships, for um, membership programs. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to try what's already being done, but also experiment with different forms of monetizing and funding your podcast, which we'll talk a little bit about, but the growth has to come, you know, at the same time. But that's what I think makes it unique. Yeah. Andrea, what about you? Yeah, totally agreed with what Devin said. And you'll probably hear us reinforcing each other's points a lot in the panel. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of things to talk about because this is what we do and see and think about every day. So just to add on to that point, I yeah, I definitely agree that community is so important. And 
like we were getting from your answers, it can definitely feel really lonely, especially if you don't have a co-host, you're not going into a studio, you're just at home by yourself with a microphone um, and with your listeners, um, even though get, even at that point, getting feedback from your listeners takes some time. So it's not really a direct relationship. But um, yeah, in that case, uh, we think it's so important to appeal to community. Um, even in terms of what some people were talking about, raising issues about um, feasibility, about time management, uh, you can even consider having uh, an accountability buddy uh, to, to check in with constantly and see where you are in your process, exchange ideas. I mean, like Devin said, it's not about competition. It's so much about supporting one another. Um, yeah, and also the, I think, Another very special thing about podcasting that, um, again, is very related to monetization as well is um, the trust that listeners have in you, especially as you build your audience. Um, your podcast should have very clear values and mission and things that you care about and, and topics. So um, then your listeners will reflect that. Um, so that's also very important in the sponsors you choose to have and to bring in and in the other monetization strategies that we'll talk about a bit later. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Shreya, I'm going to ask you the same questions, but to dive a little bit uh, deeper into the nitty gritty. When we talk about um, collaborative efforts in marketing, what does that look like in practice? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, and I'm going to try to link it with my, what, what feels podcasting, like what makes it feel so unique to me. I think like it's just the diversity of podcasting. Like, you know, the barrier to entry is low and we'll talk about this later as well, but and that can be good and bad. But one of the good things is that it does mean that there's representation of voices uh, that would not typically be heard or read. Um, and that's, kind of where the collaboration comes in because then you wouldn't have been able to meet those people outside of audio and audio is such a collaborative space. Um, for me, one of the things that I love is just uh, these things that we do call promo swaps, which is just shouting out somebody else's podcast on your show. And especially if you're in a space that's academic and then they have, there's like a lot of overlap in the Venn diagrams of the listeners. I feel like there's a lot of opportunity there to do promo swaps and it's, it's, it's easy to do. It's just like 30 seconds of you shouting out somebody else's show and in return, they shout out your show. And, and that, you know, again, links back to the point that Devin and Andrea were making about making it feel collaborative. And so that sort of answers that as well as speaks to like, growth and um yeah growth and marketing as well yeah thank you there we go i don't know what happened there but i wasn't able to unmute um, I want to touch on this discussion of the lower barrier to entry in podcasting. So I am a big fan of saying that podcasting has a comparatively lower barrier of entry than other forms of entertainment and media, but I am not a fan of saying that podcasting has no barrier to entry, which is something that we heard a lot in like the first 10 years of podcasting. And I feel like in this Last 10 years, we're saying that a little bit less, this concept of no barrier to entry. I think that we're all a little bit wiser in thinking that that is accurate when we can all acknowledge that to make a podcast, you need something like a microphone and a computer and internet access. And as somebody who has lived very close to uh, locations like uh, reservations in Arizona where there is no internet access, um, I am acutely aware that any form of podcasting requires some degree of access and has some degree of a barrier to entry. But one of the ways that I have seen that barrier of entry become even more prominent is the way that discussions on monetization and marketing are sort of gatekept away from independent producers and the way that there is this gap of knowledge where a lot of independent producers, especially people who, for instance, 
don't come from academia like many of us do or don't come from uh, an industry knowledge like many of us do. How do people even know where to start? And what resources are there for free that independent creators at any level can access right now? Um, Andrea, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, thank you. This is this is such an important discussion, especially when it comes to accessibility. I think it also made me think that pod, the podcasting space obviously has changed a lot and evolved a lot. Um, and so maybe listeners' standards are also different at this point. You know, it doesn't work to do a podcast in your car anymore if the audio quality is bad. If then you're less likely to be able to monetize. Um, but thankfully, there are many accessible um, opportunities there for you to learn about marketing and growth and things like that. Um, because another thing that is less accessible, just, just before going to, to some examples, uh, because I think this is an important conversation as well, is podcasting events in, that are in person, uh, usually conferences. There is such a good place to network, to meet people, to talk about your show and your work. Uh, but there's so, there's so much cost in travel, accommodation, the tickets. Um, so for many of us or you that don't have the opportunity to do that, obviously starting online with many, many newsletters that are available. Once you start entering the podcasting community, you're going to feel way less lonely and you're going to find a lot of other people who are just big audio fans like we are. So there are so many newsletters that weekly recommend different podcasts that weekly have tips on marketing, podcast marketing magic, podcast and newsletter, uh, Devin's Podstack, uh, there, there are so many, so many where you can get inspiration from. Um, I think social media as well um, is an important tool where you can connect with people and, you know, stay up to date with trends and what people are thinking about. Um, um, yeah, other creators' podcasts are also uh, extremely important. Podcasts about podcasting. Uh, it may feel counterintuitive since you're already working on your own, but you will always find something new and you can hear from experts, but also from other independent podcasters. So yeah, there, there are so many things and wonderful events like this one, for example. Um, yeah. I love that. And I love this discussion of part of the hurdle here being just industry education. This is something that I think about all the time. I have podcasters who have asked me throughout my career, like how they become a professional podcaster. And many of them do not keep up with the news of the podcast industry. And you really need, it is an industry. It's an entire industry. You really need to be informed and educated. So I've linked in the chat, um, the Tank Media, we have a database that's free of just newsletters that write about podcasts, whether it's reviews, industry news. Um, I think at the bare minimum, if you are working in this industry and trying to take it professionally, you should at least subscribe to pod news, whether it's the newsletter or the podcast edition. It's a quick and dirty, here's what happened in the industry today. And I think it's vital. Um, Devin, what about you in regards to these free res resources and how people can even start thinking about monetization and marketing? Yeah, I mean, there really, really is just a gap in knowledge, like you said, because especially podcast specific marketing and the monetization side, both of it is still relatively new, especially compared to the production side. There are probably a lot more resources out there for the production side. That could be courses, that could be free resources, but the marketing side and the monetization side are still new. So actually, I think a lot of the resources are free because it's so new. It's not behind as many walls as production stuff might be. So we'll mention pod news and I would 100% echo that. They even have, if you go to their website, they have a directory page, which will give you a sense of what the entire industry even looks like. What are all the hosting platforms? What are all the studios? What are all the advertising platforms? What are some of the newsletters? They lay all of that out. And then from that, if you're looking for free resources for marketing that you feel are reliable, wherever you're hosting your podcast, those hosting platforms are always putting out 
blog posts and articles that are meant to support the podcast that they host because they want you to grow and thrive as well. So even if you're not hosted on Buzzsprout and you're on Libsyn, go check out what Buzzsprout is writing about because they are just like giving away the free information on how to grow and how to monetize what the tools are that are available. Um, and then if you're looking more to the monetization, the ad side, Sounds Profitable is a huge free resource. They are doing some of the biggest research in the industry about how ads work, how audiences respond to ads, and how those things are kind of coinciding and growing together. They also, if you just feel overwhelmed by the conversation, again, they have a glossary of terms that will just help you get familiar with all of these pieces that play into growing and funding your podcast. So I think those are like the three main things, Pod News, your hosting platform, or any hosting platform's resources, and Sounds Profitable. And Andrea dropped the Sounds Profitable link in the chat. One of the things that I find incredibly important when you are learning about the industry is making sure that you are not catastrophizing. So for instance, when we see like a big push of celebrities in podcasting, I find that a lot of independent podcasters get absolutely terrified about the implications of what this could mean for them. Um, but as again, many of us have backgrounds in academia, we, I hope, all understand that something that feels true is not necessarily substantiated by the actual data. Uh, sounds profitable is hands down the best way to, at present, to get that actual data and make sure that you know the facts behind those initial panicked feelings. It's usually not as bad as it seems. Shreya, anything else to add to this conversation of free resources and where to start and how to start thinking about growth? I, I just got to say that, like, I love what's happening in the chat right now where everyone's, like, dropping their podcast. Like, that was what it's I was so going to say. I was like, <laughs> yeah, let's just, like, talk to each other. Also, I got yeah. very distracted because I listened to so many of these shows. The thing about Austin, oh, my God, I love that podcast. Arts and Letters, amazing. And I cannot believe that the Your Most Obedient and Humble Servant team is here. You make a fantastic show. So I'm just like, I kind of got a little fan girly. <laughs> I was like, oh, I love these podcasts. Um, I would also say that Reddit, I know that this is not like a, you know, like everybody uses it, but people have begun to use it and use it more. There are some subreddits um, on podcasting and podcasts like that you can you can reach out to, you can find other podcasters that are doing similar things. And in addition to what Will said about our newsletter swap, we also have a newsletter swap database. We also have our podcast swap database. I'm just dropping the link for that here. So you can see other podcasts there that are similar to yours and make connections. And also now that you've met us, like we're always happy to do an introduction when relevant. So you can reach out to us as well, especially if these amazing podcasters in the chat, once again, um, it's great to see uh, y'all finding community. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's so lovely. Um, I want to talk a little, a little bit pulling from that sounds profitable conversation. One of the things that feels true is that podcast listeners absolutely hate ads. They don't want to hear them. They think that it cheapens your show. They, If they hear an ad on a show that previously didn't have ads, they're going to unsubscribe. But what we've seen from the data is that that's not true, um, that listeners really don't care that they're fine with ads, and that if anything, they want to support your show, and they are aware that, like, in the current system of like capitalism and what have you, like you need to earn money to make the show um, and that ads are one way to do that. So that doesn't mean necessarily that every ad is created equal. When we're talking about how to structure ads, whether it, this is a paid promotion from a sponsor or we're talking about something that is free and collaborative and um, communally minded like a promo swap, how do you make an ad 
that isn't just successful in conversion rates and numbers. It's not what we're worrying about right now, but something that is artful and something that is actually useful and enriching to your audience. Um, especially again, keeping in mind this sort of academic perspective. Um, and I think also we can all just sort of say just a blanket, like make sure that you are disclosing your ads. There are laws around this. Be very explicit. Um, and also, of course, if you have any sort of institutional backing where you need to uh, be wary of uh, endorsing any specific product, service, business directly, being mindful of that. So we can all just uh, accept that as like, sure. How do you create ads that are artful and actually add something to your podcast? Shreya, I'm going to start with you this time. I had a feeling. Um, <laughs> will, are we talking specifically in this context about like ads that are being but like sponsorship ads or promos as well or both yeah both. Both. um I think that uh, like I, I come from a more advertising background so I think there's so much fun that can be had in ads and it comes from when and you can tell when it's the sponsor that has like listened to the show like they are speaking the language of the people that are listening to the show and I think like uh, ads that are placed in audio fiction shows do that do this really well because yeah will is an amazing audio fiction creator they didn't give themselves a shout out so i will do that um and so you know how this works well because like you can get a product that could be something that's like not related to the drama itself but if the copy reflects the tone of the show then i think that that is what like captures the attention in fact I actually do find myself not skipping ads when it comes to audio fiction because I'm like, it's going to be something fun. I never know when it's going to be an ad. It'll like come out of nowhere. Um, and I think I think some YouTubers do, do this really well as well. I know we're like a little touchy on YouTube right now, but, <laughs> uh, but they do these ads really well. Um, and I'm going to try to find a resource. Magellan used to have this resource where where they would have the best podcast ads. They stopped updating it, I think in like 2020 or so, but I'm gonna try to find that and put it in the chat so people can get some um, more specific examples. And I think when it comes to, uh, just, just rounding it up here, when it comes to like promo swaps, um, same thing. If you're listening to the podcast then you know the way that you should speak and also, Audio is an authentic medium, so, and people can tell. People can tell when you're not being authentic. So just try to be as authentic as you can. That's what I would say uh, on the front, like creative, creative in ads. Yeah. I'm gonna share two examples that are my absolute favorites from audio fiction. Um, the first is Within the Wires. This is by one of the creators of Welcome to Night Vale, Jeffrey Craner. And the way that he delivers his ads is so deadpan. Um, and there is a sort of like, again, like heightened academic, the first, uh, the first season is as though you're listening to um, audio going through an art gallery, but it is a strange serialized story. He gives these ads where he's very deadpan, very dry, but he's saying absurd things. And it became so popular that on their Patreon, they have a tier where you just get audio of the ads because everybody loved the ads so much. Um, so they're getting double, they're getting the money from the ads and the money from Patreon, which I think is hilarious and wonderful. My other favorite is the audio drama Margaritas and Donuts, which is a lovely, phenomenal rom-com. Uh, they actually teamed up with a local independent business uh, that, that serves margaritas and also donuts to my knowledge and used that as their advertising. So making sure that you have those local connections as well, I think is really beautiful. Um, Devin, what about you in this discussion of artful ads? Yeah, besides the copy, something else that I think is really important, which kind of ties into one of the questions I think surfacing in the chat right now is, placement of ads and being thoughtful about placement. So, oh my goodness, somebody just mentioned blank check and that was going to be one of my examples too. 
<laughs> um, their ads make me laugh every time. Uh, anyways, placements of ads of any kind of moment where you are pausing the conversation and moving into a different segment, whether it's an ad, whether it's an announcement from you, that can be dynamically inserted or that can be baked into the audio file. Can you but, define those two terms just real quick for everybody? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So when content is dynamically inserted, it means that you have gone and created your entire audio file. You're done editing. You're in your hosting platform or your ad platform. And you can go into that platform and insert say where you want to insert a piece of content. So it doesn't live in the original file. You are later inserting it and taking it out. That is any kind of dynamic content. It doesn't have to be an ad. It can be anything that you don't want to forever be in the episode. You only want it to be in for 30 days or for a thousand downloads. There's different um, variables that you can put on it. Baked in, when we say baked in, we mean that you have put it in when you're editing the file and it lives in that audio file basically forever. You don't plan on taking it out. So that's kind of the difference in how you can place ads. Um, within those two types, there is host read and there's pre-recorded. So you can have a host read, which means the host of that show reads the ad or reads the message themselves. That can be baked in or that can be dynamically inserted. And a pre-recorded one means that either another podcast or your sponsor or an ad that has requested placement on your show, they send you like a 30 second file that you either bake in or dynamically add. So there's like four different variables there with how your ad content um, can be added to your episode. But going back to placement, what is important and what is the difference between an artful and an unthoughtful ad, I think is placement. If it's dynamically inserted, there tends to be a higher chance that if it hasn't been carefully placed, it could just straight up interrupt a conversation. That breaks my heart when that happens. When you can tell that someone hasn't decided and they've let maybe just the system decide where to put the ad and it just breaks up the conversation it knocks the listener out of listening and they are I would say more likely to not be responsive to that ad because they don't feel like you've been thoughtful about their time and in introducing the ad so whether or not you have ads or any kind of messaging throughout your episodes right the thing to think about right now is where could you add those breaks so that you are setting your show up to add in ads or sponsorship messages or announcements so that your listener gets used to that process. And so that when you are ready to monetize and grow, the listener is like, oh, this is a break that they usually add. And now there is an ad. So thinking thoughtfully about placement is my long winded story. There's a lot more variables in there than I realized when I started. Um, yes. And I got another, I have another question, but I can save it for after I can get into it now. Sure. About, um, if it's related to ads and crafting those artfully, go for it. It's about inserting or working with dynamic ads. Go for it. So right now the dynamic ad market is kind of still a new thing. And I'm going to kind of do what Shreya did and relate it to YouTube. Because YouTube has had ad options for their creators for a while where you can just say, yes, I'm okay with ads running on my video. Um, this is where you can place it. Podcasts didn't always have that. Now, hosting platforms or advertising platforms are starting to offer dynamic ads, which means you can sign up to say, yes, I'm okay with dynamic ads being played on my podcast. If you... Listen to a lot of podcasts, especially ones hosted by Acast. You've probably heard their ad market in action. So I heart as well. Means, sorry? I heart as well to my knowledge. Yes, you've definitely, if you've listened to I heart, you've definitely heard I heart. You're familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the way it works is you either sign up through your hosting, sign up through the ad market, and then you can put in um, your preferences 
for how many ads, when the ads run, any type of ads you don't want to run. Um, but again, that is not something that all podcast platforms are offering yet. And it is still something because it's dynamically being inserted, you want to be really careful about how often it runs and where it's being placed. I think those are the biggest things to pay attention to. And as you're listening to podcasts now, maybe you already noticed that or you will notice that and you'll be more mindful of like, oh, well, I don't want to do what that podcast did because that didn't feel good to me as a listener. And then adjust because it's definitely something I do as a listener. <laughs> um, I hope that helps explain working with dynamic ads. But if you have more questions, we'll have more time. Yeah, feel free. If that if that didn't answer the question, feel free to add more in the chat. We'll be looking at it. Um, Andrea, anything else to add here? <laughs> I mean, this is all so it's great. Um, <laughs> this is really, really good. There's always more to add, I feel like. I think what Devin mentioned at the end about uh, paying attention as a listener is so important. Many podcasters who have podcasts don't get to listen to them as well. It can be difficult to make time for it, but it is so important to be able to listen to it from that audience perspective and apply all those things to to your own. Um, so yeah, definitely be wary of that. Um, I think the most important things have been uh, have been said, being intentional, um, also about the sponsors you choose, making sure it's something close to your heart or close to the values of your podcast or your mission. Again, that's going to be very important for your listeners, making it chatty, entertaining. Um, yeah, or according to, to the tone of your podcast, this is another thing that sounds profitable, does research and published research about, so you can really delve deep um in that um and i think the last thing i would add is making sure you check your analytics from time to time and taking a look at your demographics uh when you're choosing those sponsors also once you start implementing those ads or once you implement dynamic ads or change the tone um take a look at how your analytics change and what you can take from that um, check different platforms. Different platforms have different ways of measuring downloads, uh, which is another thing that's already talked about in Pod News, for example, which we mentioned. Um, so yeah, I think these would be a couple more things. Yeah, Shreya, I know you've got something to add here as well. Go for it. An example popped into my head, obviously, right after I was done speaking, as it happens. Um, I was thinking of like how Pantene sponsored the Crime Junkie, which was a really weird thing for them to do. But the reason that they did that was because uh, the hosts of Crime Junkie have amazing hair. Sorry. Oh, okay. So like li Pantene. 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 Like lit okay. literally yeah. Pantene. Okay. Yeah. And I was like, like yeah anyway it was awkward it was weird for me as a marketer and I'm like oh that makes a, like that sort of makes sense and also their listeners know them to have great hair and they like talked they talk about that and it made me think that like a host have like we we have these parasocial relationships with the host of podcasts that we love right so what else do they have that they talk about that they could you know start like you could get sponsorships on um maybe you have amazing hair maybe you have like really specific food and taste maybe maybe you're a vegan but your podcast isn't actually about that so whatever seems authentic and another example and i swear i'm done after this is um i love this podcast called let's talk about myths baby and it's about greek and roman mythology and the um, the hosts they are they're very vocal about feminism and which makes for a very interesting show, of course. And one of the one of the things that they sponsored, and I remember this because this was the first product I actually purchased from a podcast ad, um, was reusable sanitary napkins. And like she went off on this whole rant about it, and she's like, "This is why it's good for hygiene, for humanity, and for womankind." And I was like, "Yeah, I will buy this from you, even though it has nothing to do with your podcast itself." So I think like just again bringing it back to like aligning tone and also hosts thinking about what else are they passionate about that you can find sponsors for i'm done now i guess i should uh admit that because of the within the wires ads which i mentioned previously i did buy full-on a casper mattress and it really it it really is a very good mattress <laughs> So they can work, but this has been a lot of conversation about ads, which are a huge part of the monetization ecosystem, of course. 
But there are so many other opportunities out there for monetization um, that I think are just as valuable and sometimes, in my opinion, more valuable. Um, I want to talk about different options here. I especially want to talk about looking for things like grants. Um, but if I may, um, I am going to go off on a little bit of a spiel here about Patreon and other uh, listener supported uh, platforms. Because while I think these are some of the most important and valuable methods of monetization that pretty much everybody can access, I see that there's a question in the chat about um, advertising needing about 25,000 downloads a month to even start monetizing, which it depends on what kind of monetizing you're looking at and what have you. With something like a Patreon, anybody can start that at any point. Um, I have a Patreon for my podcast collective. Um, but one thing I just really, really, really want to caution about that I don't see people talking about nearly enough, coming to this as somebody who um, is very focused on labor rights and making sure that you are compensated for your time and your labor adequately, um, both by anybody that you're working for and your audience, Patreon, when not monitored closely, Patreon at all, you know, whether it's Patreon or Kofi or whatever, um, when not monitored closely, you can very easily find yourself creating bonus audio, bonus goodies, posts, engaging with your audience in a way where you are... Um, doing much more labor than you are being compensated for. That is going to lead to burnout. And also you are worth much more than that. You do not need to be bending over backwards and breaking your back on a Patreon in order to bring people in to monetize. It's going to be, it's going to be a net zero at best. And again, you're worth more. So if you're going to look at something like Patreon, and we can talk about Patreon best practices here and what have you, just make sure that you are factoring in all of that bonus material into the work that you're doing. With Patreon, one of the things that I do that my audience loves is I'll do full extended, not unedited, but more loosely edited versions of my audio than what goes to my public feed. The reason I do that is one, again, audiences love it. And two, it is not more work. I create one session, I use Adobe Audition, and I just mark in the audio where I'm going to cut things out from what goes on the public feed. And then I just have this larger, longer episode and I can just it's one seamless process. If you're going to start thinking about Patreon, et cetera, please be mindful of your work and your labor, which has value whether or not you are being directly paid by a company. It is still labor. It still has value. So that being out of the way, um, let's talk about some other methods of monetization. Um, Devin, I'm going to start with you here. Um, and we can still, of course, talk about Patreon, et cetera now that we're all aware that our labor has worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I want to make space and get into grants, but I, because there was that question in the chat, which Shreya has also spoken to, and I want to elaborate on, we talked so much about- Could like, you um, just recap the question real quick for the recording purposes? Yes. Thank so you. the question says, there's usually a minimum download of 25K per month to even get into the market of starting to monetize. How do you get over that hump? And we've talked a lot about ads in like an ad market, a CPM model, but that I think that's where a lot of people get stuck in the- you need 10,000 downloads before you can monetize a podcast. In an ad market, ad space, more traditional format, that is probably still true. But that is not the only way to have ads or sponsorships on your podcast. And it actually limits podcasters and probably advertisers from what is possible within this space. We talked about how... Um, 
there's like a really close relationship with audience and podcaster. And you can put together, instead of thinking about it as going to an ad market, running these dynamic ads, think about it as sponsorship options and putting together sponsorship packages. And when you think about a sponsorship package, you don't have to base it off of 10,000 downloads. This is what the market says I have to have in order to monetize my podcast because you can measure it off of other variables, other value indicators to who you want to go out to for a sponsorship. So when you're thinking about what your sponsorship model looks like, is that going out to a small business that you know your audience would resonate with and saying, hey, do you want to sponsor one episode? If you sponsor one episode, this is what you would get. You know, maybe it's like a 60 second really custom ad read the host does that is very thoughtful. Maybe it runs at the beginning and in the middle. You could have another option that says, hey, do you want to sponsor five episodes, a mini series, a whole season? And if you do that, then we will do two minute segments in every episode that tell a story that relates your pod, your product to our podcast. And you make it even more creative. You make it even like a way better ask, a way better offer to the advertiser. So you can still offer or, or ask for um, a good return on your end because you're making them this custom sponsorship package. They would not be able to reach this audience on their own through audio advertising without you going to them and offering this kind of model. You have an audience, you have value, and it's not just downloads. It is measures of engagement. How does your audience respond when you ask them questions, when you hear from any kind of reviews from them. If you can measure how engaged your audience is by like running a survey or just having some kind of community dashboard or something like that to talk to them, then the ways you are articulating this to a sponsor are through all of those different numbers and telling the full story of who your audience is and why this advertiser, this business, this company could have value if they want to, um, buy one of your sponsorship packages. So one of my favorite things to remind podcasters of is to not get stuck in the ad market CPM model that we spent so much time talking about. Logistically, that's important to understand, but it really is not the only option. And it really speaks to just how new this kind of audio advertising is for podcasters and for companies. Um, that's all I'm going to say on that for now, but I'm sure I will have more. <laughs> and Shreya, I saw you also answering this question in the chat. So if you've got anything to add here, for sure. I think I covered it in the chat. So uh, my response to Lisa was that, of course, you can have like 10,000 per episode for three consecutive episodes. But yeah, find the local businesses, find, because, you know, one thing to remember is that they also don't have too much money to spend. So like finding people who are, if you feel like you are not there yet where you want to be in terms of numbers to have bigger advertisers, find smaller ones. They have limited resources and you're, you know, like not at that level yet. Um, and I think also adding to what Devin said, in addition to numbers, one thing that we do encourage um, our podcasters to look at is engagement. Look at the completion rates on Apple Podcasts. If like if it's more than 85%, you have a really engaged audience. So yeah, two more. Are we are we talking about fun monetization strategies yet? Or yes, are, are... I was just gonna ask you to pivot there. <laughs> Go for it. And then Andrea, I'll ask you the same as well. Love, I love talking about this one because. Again, I'm going to bring you back to fiction because I, I like I'm on those Patreons and I've seen like amazing things happen. And also because there's so much flexibility that that genre allows. Um, one of my favorite ones is like naming a character after a listener. Like if you're at a certain level, like naming a character after them. Another podcast that we work with is called What Went Wrong. And it's about uh, movie production and everything that went wrong in movies that we love. And at the end of each episode, um, they will read your name out in, in like a in, the, in an intonation or an accent that is inspired the movie 
that was discussed. So like, that's a really fun one to do. So, you know, like I, I, I'm looking at some of the podcasts in this chat and I listen to them and I feel like if it was read in a certain way, like especially the letters one, like imagine if you wrote a letter I'd write at the end of your episode a 10 second letter that you would read out to all of the people that are supporting your podcast like that could be its own tier in monetization so really getting creative and tuning more into what your creative purpose is and not really kind of following what everybody else is doing because that's why you're making your show right and that's what stands that that's what helps you stand out I think For an academically minded podcast, one thing that I think would be so fun is if you have a tier of your Patreon or what have you, or a certain contribution amount um, where people can pay to essentially you would read their name, but then give them, give each person who contributes at a specific level, um, like a favorite quote from one of your sources that you're pulling from or something else related to your topic, I think would be so fun. And people like love hearing their own names uh this is something that confounds me but people get genuinely very excited about this so don't sleep on that and if you can add something that is related to your topic that's even better and then andrea other other monetization options here um and then i think after your answer i think that we'll pivot to q a if that's feeling good with everybody here okay great sounds good I mean, yeah, these are all such great ideas and I love you guys for how creative you are and just being in in the space with other people. I I think that, you know, everyone here as well can see how the ideas are flowing and how helpful it is. Um, I actually had another example for earlier when we were talking about sponsorships and local businesses. We were working with a podcast at some point called Lunch with Shelly Himes, uh, where she has different conversations in Washington, D.C. with all types of super interesting guests uh, at specific restaurants. So, uh, you know, think of the possibilities there. You can each restaurant can be a sponsor for each episode. Um, Another idea I had, and these might be less structured because I was just getting uh, ideas as you guys were speaking um, is some podcasts have a call-in segment at the end of the of the show. And again, people love hearing their names. People love calling in and hearing themselves in their favorite podcast. So that's another thing that you could do with your Patreon. Um, I would just underline what Will said again about making sure it's feasible for you, making sure you are not burning yourself out. Um, and here you can also think about repurposing your content. You know, I, I'm sure at this point you have so much content built up. Uh, so much unedited uh, material, maybe some uh, episodes that were never aired that people would love to listen to. So think of every little resource you have uh, where you can just make it feasible for you and that it's not extra extra work. Um, and then one more thing. Oh, another example could be, you know, it could be like a Discord community that you offer to your Patreon uh, subscribers and it would be exclusive for them. And yeah, one last thing I would add is to not underestimate yourself when you are asking for these sponsorships and when you're looking for these partners. Um, I think it can be so easy to do that, especially as you're in the process and as you are growing. Um, So if it's helpful to you in this process, you know, look towards your uh, community of support, look towards even your friends and family, tell them what you're doing um, and ask them for their opinion. It's so much easier, I think, to um, to talk about someone else's work and to praise someone else's work than you recognizing your own and putting the value on it. Uh, so yeah, make sure that you, you ask for support as well and do not underestimate yourself. That's what I would add to that. Perfect. So we're going to pivot to Q&A a little bit early here because we're already getting some great questions and I know that we're going to have a lot to talk about. Uh, so I do want to highlight in the chat real quick, uh, Mignon, and I think that this is maybe Mignon Fogarty of Grammar Girl. I was Girl, just which gonna is... type it. I'm like, is this Grammar Girl over here? Yes, I can't which see if they have their last name. Also, we yeah. love. Yes, one of the very first podcasts I ever listened to. Hi, Mignon. So good to see you here. Um, She says, a funny thing I saw on a fiction Patreon recently was you could have your name in the story, uh, but there were two choices. Your character dies or your character lives. That's hilarious. That's so good. Um, I would immediately say kill him off. 
kill him off. Um, but <laughs> related to this conversation of Patreon and burnout, uh, Rebecca Berry asks, um, have you have you seen examples of quick and easy Patreon content that has high impact without leading to the time intensive burnout? Absolutely. So I'm just going to give some examples here of what I do. Um, I am the CEO of the podcast collective Hug House. We make fiction and nonfiction, but all of our podcasts are very tonally aligned and created by largely the same group of people. Um, so first off, again, the extended episodes and the edited episodes that go on the main feed, having those separate is huge. Um, one of the podcasts I make is I'm reading all of the Animorphs books for the first time and having people on who are like longtime fans of the series, which by the way, those books are so good, so much better than I ever could have expected. They're so good. So we actually wind up talking for like two to four and a half hours per book. Um, and one of, uh, so related to the sort of extended episodes and the edited episodes, not only do I do the full, like semi unedited version for my listeners, I also don't split it up into individual episodes. The listeners I I've asked them, and this is what they want. They want the full like four and a half hours. <laughs> um, and that means that not only are they getting that full colossal chunk of audio, but they're also getting it well before anyone on the public feed. I only release every two weeks. So that means if it's going to be four episodes worth of audio, they're getting two months of audio all at once. And it's the extended version. So again, that is factored into my production. It doesn't really add anything because I have to cut the audio into chunks anyway, and I have it in the full version anyway. Um, other things, um, oh, for the deposition. Oh, the deposition is a different conversation. Uh, Hughouse.productions, if you want to learn about the deposition and a very absurd uh, rereading of an Elon Musk deposition, word for word. But uh, another thing that I really have found a lot of success with is I I think that many of us in podcasting have what I call uh, can't shut up disease, where we can't shut up. Um, and I have more than once hopped on mic with a friend or one of my co-creators or co-owners of Hug House to say like, I found this thing when I was researching something that I can't stop thinking about that is absolutely wild. I need to talk to somebody about this right now. It can't live on any of the podcasts. It doesn't make sense, but I need to discuss this right now. Um, and so we'll hop on mic and I will very loosely edit those. Usually I'll just do like some audio cleanup and I'll just post them on our Patreon and people love it. Um, in fact, it's become so beloved on our Patreon that I have started an entire Patreon only series where I have friends on who are very familiar with reality TV shows. And I am not, I don't, I don't go there. I don't go there. Um, it started because I had, I, kept hearing about Vanderpump Rules and I was like, I literally don't know what this is. Like, I think it's a reality show. I'm not sure. So I, I had a friend on to explain to me Vanderpump Rules and the Scandaval, some controversies. And it was great. And now I just have people on telling me about reality TV shows. It's Patreon only. And I do it for fun. Um, so these are conversations that I would have had anyway. I'm just hopping on mic and popping on on Patreon. People love it. So think of things, essentially, think of things that you already do and already have fun doing and put those on the Patreon, even if they seem silly. If, honestly, especially if they seem silly. Um, anybody else have any other thoughts on like low time investment, low labor requirements? Yeah, Shreya, go for it. I think there's something to be said about like um, accessing people in different media spaces or different, yeah, different media spaces. So like simply put, if you're just, if you're recording a podcast, transcribe it, make show notes and make it a listener only newsletter. Like simple enough, 
um, you know, you can get to them differently. One of the podcasts that I listen to and do like support is Poetry Unbound. Um, and they have this like paywall substack sort of a thing where they give a prompt um, based on, uh, yeah, sort of ba loosely based on the poetry from that week. And you can only respond to that if you are subscribed, if you're a paid subscriber of their substack. And like, again, kind of shut up disease poets have that as well. So we're just like, yeah, sure, I'll pay $5 for this just to like word vomit my feelings out uh, to strangers. Um, but I think a listener only newsletter goes a long way and it doesn't require that much effort. Another podcast that does it really well is In Betweenish, um, which I think this audience will really appreciate. It is about uh, cross culture kids and how we just go through life living differently. Um, they have a newsletter as well, and that's paid too. Um, and it's basically just subscribing. It is basically just transcribing that podcast episode, and then they add a word that's untranslatable in English. So, you know, like a very low level thing. Um, it's something that the host is already interested in. So like Will said, think about the other things that interest you and try to weave that into your existing content. Hope that helps. One thing I just thought of too, that I think is really important is People want to give you money. People want to support you. If they like your work, they will want to support you regardless of what they get. So I am also a huge proponent of having a Patreon that you don't use or post anything on. You just have like $5 a month. Support me for $5. That's it. That's what you get is being able to give back to the show that you love. And I have seen those be really successful. So don't don't think that you even need to necessarily have anything. You just need to have somewhere for people to give you money. Um, Andrea, go for it. Yeah, I love that. I would just add to the newsletter um, idea that Shreya was talking about, which is so great that people also probably, your listeners wanna hear about your podcasting journey. Uh, your good times, your difficult times, your even technical diffic difficulties, whatever it is. Um, if you've been to an event recently that was very helpful, such as this one, and you want to share some thoughts, um, you know, you can record it and then transcribe it. And that's, you know, that can be faster. You can just write it directly. But um, I think your audience, uh, especially if they're they're so loyal to podcast hosts, as as we were talking about. So they would love to know, your process and what you're going through. And maybe hopefully a bunch of them are also podcasters and then it would also help them. And who knows you will, who you will connect with um, in that way. And of course I thought of another, I feel like those are just going to keep popping up. Um, if you write notes for your podcast at all, um, make those a view only. Um, I personally, I don't prefer PDFs only in regards to accessibility reasons. PDFs can be really hard for a lot of screen readers, for instance. But I, when I take notes for podcasts, I have a view only or comment only uh, for patrons, which I think is fun. Just a, a comment or view only uh, link for Google Docs. Link those. Don't worry about your notes looking good or even necessarily being comprehensible to anybody who's not you. Um, I share notes for all of the episodes that I write notes for, and people love that. Another thing, and this is, this takes a bit more confidence. Um, sometimes I will post the note document when I start it. And so people are actually in the Google Doc watching me take these notes as I'm doing them. Um, similarly, I think that a work cited or like an annotated bibliography can go so far. Um, obviously always cite your sources in your show notes, etc. But if you have like actual notes and annotations for why you use these sources and further reading, I love things like that. And I'm guessing that your audience does as well. Devin, do you have any other thoughts on low in like low time intensity, low labor, Patreon, et cetera, um, bonuses for, for supporters. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like anytime the audience can feel like they're part of helping drive the show can help. So whether that's like, I have these three topics or guests in mind, who do you want to see first vote on who my next guest is? 
Um, another one that a few different shows do in a few different ways is the ability for Patreon patron subscribers to submit questions. And you can do that in two ways where it's, they just get the opportunity to submit questions or something that um, culture study does because Anne Helen Peterson has a newsletter as well that goes with the podcast. Um, you can submit questions. And then towards the end of the episode, she always goes, we're going to answer this one other question, but it is only for subscribers. It is only for our paid subscribers. So that's why it's like two sides of it where you are just collecting questions or one, you're also making the answers only to paid subscribers. And that isn't a lot on you and it isn't a lot on your guest. It's just an extra question. But if it's a really good question, people will want to hear it. And so I think that that's maybe a low lift. If you are especially a guest-driven show, I think it can really help. Yeah, with that newsletter as well, I believe that at Culture Study, Ann Helen Peterson also occasionally just has like open threads for like, what are my subscribers working on? Talk about what you're working on. Let other subscribers know about it, um, which I think is really, really lovely. And then another model that I want to talk about that I haven't thought about for some time, but I think kind of falls into this area is, and this is moving a bit away from Patreon. You could use Patreon for this, especially now that they have added um, like purchases, like one-off purchases in their platform. This is a new thing to Patreon which has traditionally been a monthly or by creation subscription model. They now have essentially an e-commerce storefront, um, which I think is very exciting. Um, another thing to be aware of with that is that if you have for me, like for instance, my extended versions of the audio or bonus audio is exclusive to $10 a month or up subscribers, but I can also make all of those extended and bonus audio pieces individual purchases within Patreon. So you don't have to necessarily subscribe at those levels to purchase those. This is, again, new and I think incredible. Um, <clears throat> and it makes me think about having the option, whether it's through Patreon, other e-commerce, or like directly they get into contact with you. Um, maximum fun. I don't remember if they still do this, but they used to do this you could purchase for pretty reasonable amounts, I think like $150 for some of the shows, a mid-roll ad, so something that is in the middle of your show. And it would be, it could be a listener advertising their podcast, their product, or it could just be a listener giving a little shout out to their friend or loved one who's also a fan of the show. Very famously, back when the McElroy brothers used to have this option open on their podcasts, like The Adventure Zone and My Brother, My Brother and Me, which are uh, colossal comedy podcasts, there were like at least five different marriage proposals in the middle of their podcast. It was lovely. So having something where people can just pay for you to read a shout out or read an ad, you do not have to be on a network to do that. You can just have your listeners do that directly. Again, Patreon is one model, but there's plenty of others out there where people can just purchase. Obviously, if you do that, make sure that you have some sort of uh, phrasing that you can reject any any of these because you never know what things people will try to get you to say with your voice so be wary of that um we have another question in the chat here for most of us podcasting is not our full-time job as academics we do this in addition to our full work week absolutely and as somebody who has worked in academia i know that that work week um is usually well over 40 hours a week so being cognizant of that. Any tips, any quick tips for folks out here who have little time, like one big thing to do? My tip here is to just make sure that there is any widely visible public platform for people to give you money. You do not need to give anything in return. Make sure that you have a call to action in your audio where you say, 
I make this in addition to my full-time job and I make it for you for free. If you would like to support it, please go here. Have one link, just give people a way to give you money, whatever that way looks like for you. Andrea, go for it. Yes, I love that. And I think one one thing we didn't touch upon is being very upfront with your listeners. Do not be shy to communicate with them. First of all, any change in your content, in your format, anything at all, but also especially when it comes to monetization, uh, your top listeners and your you know the audience that feels the closest to you they want you to thrive and they super I'm gonna lower my hand uh they super appreciate your work um and they realize the yeah like like Will was saying the world we live in this is uh you know it's 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 difficult it's difficult um so yeah being upfront with them is definitely something that we encourage you to do a hundred percent and then it will also uh bring in other listeners that maybe were not listening on the regular even closer to you um because of that transparency yeah we think that's super important yeah in the chat just real quick um we have an addition from uh lisa uh bartfi i hope i'm saying that correctly please correct me if i'm not um, for many in this forum, there are also limitations for how to receive funds for a podcast that has some associ association within the institution. Absolutely true. Uh, make sure, obviously, that you're staying very close within these guidelines. This is also um, one of these opportunities where I think institutional backing can have some leverage when it comes to things like grants. So think about what makes sense with whatever institution you're working with, whether you're independent, whether you're coming from an institution, and look for resources within those institutions. Um, and Mary Helen Kubit says, see if that institution development office can create a gift fund for you to receive contributions. I love this. And if there is any opportunity to tell your audience that their donation can be made a tax write-off, do that. That's huge. Um, yeah, Devin, Sh oh, Shreya, I see your hand raised. Go for it. Um, I'm just going to bring it back to um, Mary's question about the one big thing to do for people who are like, limited on time. Have the podcast newsletter. Like, I'm going to bring back my initial recommendation about like transcribing your show. That's easy lift for you. That also helps you build community and have an audience that is, we always say like, if you have a newsletter, that audience is yours as opposed to just podcast listeners or social media followers. Um, and so you have an engaged audience. You can always paywall it in the future. Like you'll see how it starts it starts to become less and less work. It's already less work to begin with. And then slowly it will become less work. Like most of us here have, uh, have newsletters. So this is very much coming from a personal, uh, personal recommendation. Yeah, hope that helps. Andrea, anything else to add here? Um, I'm laughing at this. Uh, Miniana also adds a super, another super funny thing I saw on a newsletter subscription was an extra expensive option that was called something like, if your employer is paying. That's hilarious. That's so good. Andrea, anything else uh, to add here? I Yeah, I think these are the, the main things, I would say, and just making sure that whatever you're doing, it's feasible for you always. Totally. I think with that, um, I want to just give some more resources and talk about how you can find us. Um, one thing, I, I recently went to a podcast festival called Resonate, which was absolutely incredible. Um, I'll actually drop a link to that. Um, as a heads up, Resonate is amazing. It is a bit expensive. Oh, hey, Chioki, it can be a bit expensive, but it and it sells out incredibly fast because it's so good. Um, so happy to see you here, Chioki. Um, really incredibly beautiful, very creator focused and very like art focused, which I really needed um, to sort of like reinvigorate my spirit in audio. When I was there, um, I talked to a few people who had heard of Tank, um, but they they had questions for us, but they were shy to reach out because they were worried that they necessarily couldn't necessarily afford working with us. And I just want to say like, all of us at Tank are here because we love audio and we love everyone who creates in this space. You can reach out to us. 
Like you don't have to work with us to ask us questions and like talk shop. We all love talking shop. So you can reach us at like first name at tinkmedia.co, not .com, .co. Um, hit us up if you have questions. Uh, we, we love discussing. We love sharing resources. Yes, Resonate is November 7th and 8th, 2025. Tickets drop July 1st. And literally right now, if you want to go to a festival that is, again, focused on the art, focused on the craft by some of the most incredible speakers who are working in the industry right now, thinking about Nicole Hill, about Jasmine Green, about Avery Truffleman. These were amazing sessions. Um, go put it in your Google calendar, calendar or whatever calendar that you have right now, July 1st, because tickets will sell out that day within hours. I'm not joking. And it is worth it. It's a beautiful festival. Um, and I believe that's just about our time. So again, you can find us at tinkmedia.co. You can email any slash all of us at first name at, at tinkmedia.co. Um, I believe that this recording will be available, but I believe that's up to, okay, good deal. will be available. Um, and thank you for what you're working on. This industry would not exist without what you're doing. And as lovers of audio, first and foremost, I know that everybody here at Tank really, really appreciates what you're doing. No matter how small it might seem, no matter how lonely it might seem, you have people who care. So thank you all so much. Thank you for your time. Reach out if you have more questions and I will relinquish the space back. Bravo. Thank you so much to all of you. This was phenomenal. And I can tell that this is a really life affirming, joyful place to work. So thank you for bringing that energy to all of us today as well. I'm going to share something in the chat real quick. The collaborative Google Doc that I mentioned in the welcome address is now available for editing or commenting on. If you want to contribute more of your own thoughts about what do you feel about best practices in the concept of podcasting? Jump on in, see what people have put in from the Mentimeter. And since then, um, I'm going to leave this Zoom meeting open because when we come back at one o'clock Eastern, we're going to have session three in here. That's best practices for student faculty collaboration. If you are looking for session four, hold on, let's see if I got the link handy. Session four will be best practices for optimizing your reach through YouTube, and that will include Mignon. That link is right here. All right. Thanks, everyone. If you have additional questions for me or if you want to chat with each other, I'll leave this open. But in the meantime, enjoy your lunch if you're East Coast or Central, and we'll see you back here at one o'clock Eastern. Thanks, everyone.